right, and we're live. Hey everyone, welcome to the Stanford Emosis Seminar Series. I'm Kron. We have with us today Dan, Piero, Fyodor, and our guest today, Shreya. Um, so this week we're going to be talking to Shreya about uh, debugging machine learning models in production. And as always, the format is going to be a 30-minute talk followed by a 30-minute podcast-style discussion. So uh, you guys can ask questions in chat, and we'll keep track of the chat during Shreya's talk and, and, and communicate those to her during the discussion. And just feel free to keep uh, asking questions during the talk. Um, Shreya is a computer scientist who lives in San Francisco, who uh, is taking a break from work right now, actually. And she used to work at Wyaduct as the first ML engineer. She was a brain before and did her various degrees at Stanford. Um, she, if you follow on her, Twitter, her on Twitter, she obviously tweets a lot about machine learning and systems. So a lot of interesting things there. Uh, we we're hoping for some controversial opinions, but we'll see. Um, and she's going to be talking to us about um, machine learning pipelines in production. So I'll let her uh, take over. Take it away, Shreya. Yeah, thanks everyone for having me. Okay, let me share my screen and let me know if you don't see it. Looks good. Cool. Okay. Um, so today I'll be talking about debugging ML in production. Um, hopefully I'll get through all the slides, but um, we'll see. I'll start a little bit by giving an overview of my background, kind of um, what my interests are and talk a little bit then about production ML pipelines from both a people perspective. perspective. Um, I'll go through a very simple case study of what happens post deployment um, and highlight some challenges and areas for future work. And please uh, type in any questions. I guess we'll save them for the end. Um, but without further ado, let's get started. Um, so I did my undergrad and master's from Stanford, yes, um, my undergrad was in systems, my master's or my co-term was in AI. Um, while I was at Stanford, I also did research in adversarial ML and deep learning robustness at both Stanford and Brain. Um, and then right after graduation, I went to an applied ML startup as the first ML engineer. Um, and this was very different for me from, I guess, doing ML research. And I'm going to try to gear this talk more towards researchers or people who are working on this kind of ML in the real, real world research. Um, but I worked with so much more data than I ever had done in research. Um, I also helped to build the infrastructure for large scale ML and data analytics. So maybe that involves you know, setting up a cluster and kind of how do we build tools for data scientists to work with such large amounts of data. Um, and then the responsibilities, I think this is this is not specific to like my startup or that I was at, but any startup is you just do everything. You do recruiting, you do engineering, ML, product, data science, and more. Um, so really my interest kind of evolved from um, doing research on robustness and deep learning models in an academic setting. Um, maybe that includes like fairness or generalizability to unknown data or security. Um, but then in industry really, I. I realized we, it's very different from academia and that I wanted to train few models, but do lots of inference on each model. Whereas in academia, I don't know, for a paper, you, you're like running so many trading scripts, you get something and you're like, oh, finally, I can now write a paper or something. Uh, but really the, the goal is to be able to eke out as much inference as you can from models in industry. And a key question that that motivates is what happens beyond that test set? or validation set. Um, how do you deploy them and how do you monitor them? How do you know when to retrain models? A lot of these questions are kind of unanswered in academia and getting to that depressing truth, I guess, about ML and um, my experience was that most data science projects don't actually make it to production. Very few of them do. And I think this is because of many reasons, but one big one um, that many speakers in the series even have talked about previously um, is that data in quote unquote, the real world isn't necessarily clean and balanced like our canonical benchmark data sets in research. This data is also always changing, especially if it's time series data. And the bottom line here, I think is um, showing high performance on a fixed train and validation set is not necessarily imply um, high performance when that model is deployed. And hopefully I'll be able to illustrate that in a small case study later on. Um, so today's talk really is not how to do data science or feature engineering. I don't think I'm that person. 
but today I'll be discussing um, hopefully a sort of high level overview of ML pipelines, specifically focusing on what is the collaboration behind these ML projects like, and then also from a technical perspective, what are the components of these pipelines? What are the tools being used and um, really motivating that mo modeling is just one part of that pipeline. And then I'll follow up with this case study of challenges that I've been alluding to. Hopefully this motivates uh, ML discipline for people to work on and feel free to ask questions, of course. Starting with the components of production ML pipelines, I think at a high level, I'll talk about two things. One is the people aspect and the other one is the technical aspect. And the people aspect is definitely not really thought about as much in academia, I think, as um, the technical aspect. Um, but diving into the people aspect, so usually in an ML project or um, team, there are lots of stakeholders and many technical dependencies. So maybe that includes the data model, evaluation metrics, who knows? And the key thing here is that the different st stakeholders in my experience, and also many people's experience, um, speak different languages. Whereas maybe on a research project, you're working with a bunch of researchers who all are very, very technically experienced in that domain. Um, but these different stakeholders like PMs, data scientists, engineers, even the client, biz dev, everyone speaks a different language. Um, and especially if you're doing applied ML, uh, rarely have I ever seen like you throw a deep learning model at a very large data set and it works well on the first try. So kind of a lot of the question is how do you do intelligent feature engineering, um, especially for problems that you uh, may or may not have domain expertise in. Like for example, I worked at an applied ML startup for car companies. I don't know anything about cars. Um, definitely, I don't know how, what like a broken cam shaft or whatever is. So how do you kind of work with domain experts to come up with good features um, and standardize that into ETL pipelines? Um, the other thing um, that I experienced a lot in industry is you have changing data and business requirements, specifically business requirements that you don't necessarily see in academia. So maybe that means tomorrow the client is interested in high precision and the day after tomorrow they're interested in high recall. Uh, this is two very different ML tasks, as you probably know, um, and how do you kind of design like a workflow and iterative improvement around this. Um, one other thing is modeling is just one part of the pipeline, and that can be owned by like maybe an ML practitioner or a data scientist. Uh, but it's also treated as software, and one implication of this is that in software, right? People will build the software and other people will maintain it. Um, it's not necessarily one person maintaining a software project till T equals infinity. Um, you need to be able to onboard other engineers into the project, but this is very hard to do, I think, for ML um, because I mean, it's very hard to like manage a model that you didn't, didn't necessarily create, especially with all of the versioning and artifacts around it. Um, and even to illustrate kind of the complexity of this kind of uh, people overview, I found this nice screenshot from this uh, MLOps book. And um, I, I think all of these blue rectangles are definitely necessary, like from data acquisition to like QA testing, if not more. Um, it's ex the point here is that it's extremely complicated, I guess, collaboration working across this whole stack. And this can be specific to just one ML task. The complexity grows when you're at a large company and all of a sudden, you have so many ML projects going on. Um, really, how do you find the common denominator among those, among those projects um, and standardize these processes? Cool. Um, so really, before I dive into the technical overview, I also want to talk a little bit, I want to motivate kind of like, what is the common pattern that I have personally seen um, in these kinds of applied ML projects? Um, so as I mentioned before, there are a lot of stakeholders, maybe that includes a domain expert, but really I think um, the people align on the metrics, uh, write the pipelining around the MO model. So maybe that means like treating the model as like an if statement or like a decision tree and doing everything from the post ETL, um, designing the schema for, I don't know, any intermediate tables you might have planning ahead for the deployment infrastructure. Um, and then really once that's in place, kind of iterating on EDA, modeling, deployment, and so forth to improve upon that. Um, to dive into some of the technical system overview, I found this on the Michelangelo blog post, which I think is a pretty great read for those interested um, in just 
what it means to build like an ML platform at one of these large companies. Um, two key things I want to highlight here. One is that um, you want to be able to build a system that allows multiple data scientists or ML projects to operate um, and even collaborate with each other. So maybe you want to kind of like build some sort of shared feature store right here. I don't know if you see my cursor, um, but you want to build some sort of shared feature store that allows many downstream dependencies um, of ML projects to work. The other thing I want to highlight here is um, there's a difference between like the offline and the online approach. And um, maybe the offline approach means uh, you're a data scientist and you are looking at data lakes or tables or features in an offline setting, trying to develop your models to establish some sort of baseline metric. And then you deploy it to production and it's being used in an online setting where you perform inference on every record as it comes in. Um, and this can be challenging because the data or the infrastructure itself for both online and offline I've seen is like pretty different. Um, so how do you kind of have those like shared feature stores? Um, how do you make it easy and quick? If you, especially if you're trying to run the model um, in real time, um, it can be very challenging. And when I was at my most recent startup, uh, we kind of had to build this infrastructure for ourselves. And some key learnings that I uh, got from there were that scalability and reproducibility were really kind of the most important things. And that involves a lot of things that specifically involves, you know, what does it mean to build a CI and CD system specifically for machine learning? Um, you can imagine like software development in general without Git or GitHub, like I don't know how that would work at other companies. And we're kind of at that state in machine learning in which every company is inventing its own sort of CI CD tool that does versioning of like everything from trained test sets to the actual model binary to model parameters, the metrics and et cetera. And one interesting thing that I learned when I was kind of um, trying to iterate on all of this stuff was at some point I was versioning the model binaries, but I wasn't versioning things like the metrics and um, other metadata around that. So when it came down to figuring out which is the model that I needed to deploy to production, and I had two model binaries sitting in front of me with like similar train sets, um, I had no idea how to compare them because I had not logged the metrics with it. So one fun and interesting thing I learned is like, yes, we have these tools out there, Maybe it's like a different tool for each one of these um, artifacts. But for example, MLflow is a really amazing tool, I think. Um, but I had to spend many months figuring out what exactly to log to these systems. So that way I knew um, how to actually compare the models and uh, figure out which one to promote. And that leads to um, one of the key learnings that I also got was that creating a prediction or like doing a forward pass through this infrastructure can be very easy but backtracing that prediction can be hard. So for example, maybe that means a client has said, oh, there was a bug in this prediction from two weeks ago. What, what happened? Why did this happen? And uh, what does that mean from the ML side, right? You go and figure out like, okay, what was the version of every code? What was the version of the model? What was the version of everything from two weeks ago? Maybe it involves digging through various logs to do this. Um, and the more complicated, like one ML pipeline could involve retraining and restaging multiple model binaries. More complicated it is, the more challenging it is to do in practice, especially when, I mean, we're in this like field of ML ops and there's like 300 ML ops companies out there. Um, can be hard to navigate. Cool. Um, so I want to switch gears a little bit into uh, illustrating kind of like, okay, maybe you have good performance on a train and validation set, um, but what happens when you release that? Um, it's very easy to get a performance degradation. So I, I do that with a simple example using this uh, publicly available New York taxi cab trip data with these various features. Um, it's a tabular data set. I think the important ones are like just pick up and drop off times, number of passengers, how long the trip was, uh, various location zones, um, and then the dollar amounts. And this data is like all nicely stored in a public S3 bucket and it's monthly files for the last, I don't know, decade or so. And it's also fairly large. Um, so I think this is also common in a lot of 
projects that I worked on outside of academia was just a lot of like fatigue thinking about okay now I have 100 gigabytes of data like I need to figure out how to do all of this pipelining around it or like set up uh, figure out like what are the requirements of the machine that I need to use to work on that um, but let's dive in um, for this exercise we'll train and quote unquote deploy a model to predict whether the user gave a large tip and I know that this is maybe not like a business critical ML problem to solve, but it's just to say, for the sake of highlighting kind of these like post deployment ML issues. Um, and I use these various tools, Python, Dask, to manipulate the large data sets. Um, and the goal really here is to demonstrate like what can go wrong post deployment, what are some of the challenges that we see. Um, and really, even if you train and evaluate soundly or as soundly as you can get in an offline setting, you can still run into a lot of problems. Um, for the ML side of things, really, we just learn a classification model um, that tries to predict uh, whether the writer tipped more than 20% of the total fail. So it's binary classification. Super straightforward. We don't want to overfit. Um, and we measure the F1 score here. Um, I use a random forest classifier with just standard hyperparameters, um, super similar to the scikit-learn API. And I use the like, I had found some medium posts that have these hyperparameters. So I'm sure you can do better than whatever this is getting. Um, so we train on January, 2020, validate on the data set of February, 2020 and then simulate like, okay, we take this trained model and then how does it perform March onwards? Um, note that I don't have a holdout validation set here because I don't do any hyperparameter tuning. If you were to do hyperparameter tuning, you should probably do that. But we measure F1 score, um, which is just a combination of precision and recall. Um, and conceptually, really all you need to know about that is like the higher the F1 score, uh, the better it is because you want to have uh, fewer high, fewer false positives and false negatives. Cool, so here is a snippet of, I load January, 2020, pre-process it, train a class, fit a classifier to it, and then dump the F1 score. Cool, I, I don't really know what this means in terms of ROI or business metric, but just imagine that this was, I don't know, standard or good enough. We want to make sure that we don't overfit too much. So we load February, 2020, um, and we get a very similar F1 score, which is awesome. Um, oh, by the way, the code is on my GitHub. So it's in a notebook. Feel free to look at it whenever you want, if you want. Um, and as I mentioned before, there are some caveats of no hyperparameter tuning. Um, very unclear if this solves like a business relevant problem. Um, unclear if that maps to any ROI. But anyways, we will move on. Um, so to simulate like a deployment, really all we do here is just uh, run the model um, on like a record by record basis in for March, 2020. And I won't really talk about the infra challenges around this. I mean, we, can, we can talk about it in Q and A if people are interested, um, but the, all, it'll motivate some other ML wise challenges around this. One being in practice, we experience like a form of data lag um, where data may come into our databases after some sort of time. Here, we have no data lag um, in this example, but in practice, like whenever I've worked on applied ML problems, particularly maybe for cars, um, if a repair happens in a vehicle, we don't know about it the next second. It takes like a month for them to tell the car manufacturer and then the car manufacturer has to tell us and like that takes another, who knows, that's up on the air. Um, so really, like models can may not be able to reflect the most recent data that could pose some ML issues. Um, another thing around deployment is you want to do streaming or batched inference. And I don't think you can really make this decision based on um, technical considerations or business considerations alone. Um, for example, your infrastructure might not be able to do streaming inference. Um, but from a business standpoint, like maybe you have to do inference after every record comes in. Um, so having the, I, I remember talking to several of my colleagues about, okay, like what are the business requirements? What are the technical requirements? What can we do to satisfy everything? 
Um, for this example, we simulate inference on each record as it comes in a stream, um, but we compute metrics in batch, meaning that we take all the rides for a day um, and then we'll compute the F1 score on that. And we'll also compute it in a rolling fashion. Um, so as every day goes on, we compute like an updated F1 score. Um, cool. So I mentioned the lag challenge. That'll be my first challenge before. We don't have lag here, but just to dive in a little bit into the different types of lag, you could have just generic like feature lag, which is our system only learns about the ride well after it has occurred. You could also have label lag, which is maybe we got all the features, but we didn't, didn't learn about the fare or the tip amount um, until well after the ride has occurred. Um, and in practice, these, these, don't, these lags don't need to be like exactly the same. They might be very different, especially if the data sources are different. Um, and when dealing with lag, the evaluation metric will inherently be lagging. And I think that implies that at training time, right, your model may not be able to reflect the most recent uh, window of time. Okay, so simulating the live inference here, basically just I load the March data, uh, pre-process it. Um, what else do I do? I compute two types of F1, one being the rolling F1. So after every day, what was the F1 score from the beginning of March until the end of that day? And then I also compute the daily F1 score, which is just for the rise that day, what was the F1 score of our model? And as you can see, like, okay, maybe like there's high variance day to day, uh, but the rolling F1 score by the end of the month doesn't team, seem too different from the February, the 66% that we had in the train and the test sets. But um, if you inspect the daily F1s a little bit further, it's also in my GitHub. I couldn't put all of it here. Um, you'll notice that the daily F1 score drops significantly um, as time goes on later in the month. And that probably <laughs> it indicates that COVID had an impact on taxi rides, which I'm not surprised by. Um, but there is this large discrepancy between the rolling metric and the daily metric, which highlights like what you monitor is very important, right? There are a lot of these tools that do this, that help you like log all of these metrics. But at the end of the day, it's extremely important to know what exactly to log. Um, if we just were logging the rolling F1, it might take us until like mid-April to the end of April to figure out that there might have been an issue. Whereas um, I don't know, hopefully we would have found this degradation in performance with the daily F1 had we been monitoring that. Um, and just to highlight that this is not maybe specific to March, um, we can also evaluate it on future months, May and June, or April, May and June, to see that this is definitely not 66%. Um, and that motivates a lot of questions. I think, because I personally saw this multiple times whenever I was deploying models, especially on time series data. Like, how do we establish confidence in this train and test process? Like, when do you know how to retrain the models and so forth, right? Because the data might be changing over time, might drift over time. And obviously the models will need to change to reflect that. How often do you retrain the model? And if you retrain the model like thousands of times a day, right? This retraining can add complexity to the overall system, more artifacts to version and keep track of. Um, it can be expensive in terms of compute and time and energy. Like if you're retraining like big transformer models, um, that's the problem in terms of compute. Um, and just like, who's, who's gonna manage that? Who's going to like have that mental load of dealing with all of these models? Um, another, I think bottom line question is like, how do you know when the data has drifted over time? Um, and there's some literature out there, I think that tries to um, tell you like, oh, your data has changed or these two distributions are statistically significantly different. So maybe you should retrain your model. Um, so I'll jump into a little example of applying such a method. Um, so there's one paper called Failing Loudly um, that basically says, okay, let's, we have two, um, samples of data um, and basically we'll try to figure out if they're different from each other. We'll do some dimensionality reduction on each one, run some sort of two sample test and then see, okay, does this test tell us that it's significantly different or not? Um, so for this, I skipped the dimensionality reduction. Um, they also mentioned that multiple univariate testing seems to be as good as multivariate testing. 
Um, maybe that's just specific to their MNIST and CIFAR experiments, but uh, regardless, just for now, we employ their multiple univariate testing. So essentially what that means is for each feature, we run a two-sided KS test. And I don't know any stats, but I can tell you at a high level what this KS test um, kind of does, which essentially if you have two CDFs um, of your features, you want to find the biggest difference between the CDF. So maybe that's like when X is negative point, I don't know, like 0, 03 or something like right here. And then relate this test statistic to the overall um, magnitude of the data um, and see if that's, I don't know, statistically significant or not. Unfortunately, you can do this in like Sci SciPy or so any language. Um, so we can do that. We can try to use this to compare the January and February data sets. So we'll come up with 11 test statistics for each of our features. Um, so I essentially just run the two-sided test. And I think, yeah, one thing is remember that January and February traded test sets had very similar metrics. Um, so you wouldn't expect the distribution of data to be very, very different. However, um, many of you may know, like if you try to run two-sided tests or any statistical test, when you have thousands of rows in your um, data column, uh, you might just get small p-values because you have such a large sample size. And when you when you look at this, right, it's like, okay, here are our features. You have p-values of like 10 to the negative 258. Like, what am I supposed to do with this? Um, does it mean that this, I don't know, these alert bells will start ringing every single time? Um, I'm trying to compare two very large distributions, maybe. And how does that work well in practice for like, how, if I'm going to deploy this model on a regular basis, I don't know. Um, and I think, I don't know if I have the slide in here for comparing uh, January and March, but essentially it's the same, very similar p-values. Um, it's unclear how to find the difference really between these two experiments, which is hard because we know that there was a significant performance degradation. So we want, we, we want a method that doesn't have this many false positives. Um, and I mean, maybe this method works well when the data has drifted and we experience a performance drop, but it could be annoying and flag drift even when the metric is unchanged. So it's still an open question, I think, of like really how do you know when the data has shifted, um, especially if you're working as, with time series data. But people ask this question really because they wanna know when to retrain their model. So um, very open question, would love to see more research around this, um, yeah. Um, yeah, in my experience, this method has flagged distributions as different more than I wanted to. I've never actually been able to get anything useful from this or even other methods. Like, for example, you could track the mean and the variance of the distributions over time. But um, especially when you have like long tail distributions where you don't have normally distributed data, right? Like, what do you make of these statistics? They might just change because the data is not normally distributed. Um, what do you do there? Cool, so moving on to a more high level challenge of this whole process, right? Like how do you establish more confidence in your training and evaluation pipeline, right? Even just evaluating one model or validating one model is not enough, right? As we have seen. So what does that mean, right? We Maybe we want to validate the process of training and evaluating models. So we wanna get a little bit meta, um, but this can look different for different applications. And like, I've talked to so many data scientists and everybody has a different way of doing this. Maybe that means rolling train and validation sets. So maybe that is, I fix the architecture of the model and I train it on January, evaluate it on February. I train it on February, evaluate it on March. Train it on March, evaluate it on April and so forth. But then this whole training procedure, right? Like you can um, come up with like so many trained models and maybe you only promote the last model to production. Um, but what's the criteria then for promoting the architecture or that model to production? Um, do you need to achieve the acceptance criteria on every rolling set? Uh, what if you fail on just one rolling set? And then do these rolling sets just increase as time goes on? Also um, can get very, very complicated quickly is basically the point that I'm trying to make. Um, and furthermore, when you have all of these um, models that you're training, right? Like automated retraining is annoying. Um, tracing the lineage of all of this is annoying. Um, 
the more complex your pipeline is just in general, like the harder it is to maintain, right? It's just software. Cool. Um, another challenge around all of this, right, is collaboration. Um, so really in post-deployment is you're not the only one, the ML practitioner is not the only one interacting with a model. But in fact, they're probably not even interacting with the model. There's some sort of end user or client or PM, business person, you don't know. And not everyone is trained in ML speak. And I think this points to um, a broader phenomenon in the field of maybe, Maybe algorithm means a series of steps that somebody controls, but algorithm to me as a practitioner is like the optimizer, uh, whether I use Atom if I'm doing deep learning or um, the data set and just like the model architecture that I choose. And this is fundamentally very different from algorithm in terms of like what a client might think. For them, like algorithm is everything from they upload their data to an S3 bucket so they get some predictions from some API. Um, so how do you kind of like navigate these kinds of differences in what people believe about the system? Um, and another thing that poses a challenge is that ML, right, as opposed to software is inherently very probabilistic. So what does that mean? Uh, we know we will get some predictions wrong, but we don't know which predictions we'll get wrong. Um, and how do you communicate that, right, to clients who are, uh, who have worked a lot with SaaS and they understand how software works? but they go and look at a specific data point that comes out of the model and they say, hey, this was wrong. How do you train them to look at things and from like a very high level like batch perspective? And um, also very hard. So I think I hope that motivated a lot of areas for future work. I mean, there are just a few challenges and this wasn't even specific to deep learning. I think there's so many more problems around deep learning. Like one example being, what if we have a deep learning model that dumps um, embeddings uh, or intermediate representations as features. Um, if somebody is managing the embeddings model, how when they update the model, do they like inform all of the downstream data scientists who depend on those features, and then like everybody else has to, I don't know, update their models? Um, that seems complicated. And in practice, um, at least from a lot of companies that I've talked to, that are lar larger and have multiple data science projects going on. They have different forks of embedding models. So every team or even every data scientist might just be working off their own little fork, um, which can get complicated to manage. Um, and then another from a more like mathematical perspective, right, is deep learning in general. A lot of these models are very over-parameterized. So you could have um, two models that achieve similar test set metric, but have widely different performance in um, when you run inference in real time or simulate live deployment or do live deployment. Um, so how do you kind of monitor that? How do you, how do you prepare for those kinds of challenges? Um, and then from an engineering perspective, like tooling in general or ML ops for all of this, right, is a big can of worms. Uh, I think there's just hundreds of tools and startups out there. It's pretty insane. I don't know all of them, but I can tell you that I'm fatigued just thinking about more tools at this point. Um, so maybe it is at the minimum, we get some sort of culture shift around this. Maybe it's we appreciate, I don't know, sell it, what, we appreciate iterating on the data just as much as iterating on the modeling, for example. Um, and I think there's just in general in this field, like a lot that we can learn from software. So like modularity, um, debugging, just in general, how do we have good practices and how do we, um, yeah, build a model that works on a regular basis in industry. So with that, um, yeah, you can see the code, hopefully it runs, um, and then feel free to email me um, if you have any questions or ask them in the chat. Thanks, awesome. everyone. Thanks so much. Yeah, it was uh, really interesting. And thanks for that example. I think that was... Uh... A uh, nice way to ground some of the stuff that we were talking about. And uh, yeah, so I guess uh, just playing off of that, I one of the things I was curious to hear from you was um, you talked a little bit about feature label lag and some of the challenges with distribution shift in, um, in industry. Um, can you speak a little bit more to what people actually end up doing in these scenarios? Like, um, is it just a case of let's figure out manually, then we should be going back and update. Like the F1 scores drop by points, we can't handle that anymore. Um, and let's just go back and retrain. I think there was a comment in chat as well about uh, from Ganesh who's, uh, who says he works, works in a pretty 
a regulated area. And what they ended up doing is just asking end users like uh, about what they require. And then when they, they're, they're unhappy, they just go back and update the model. So I'm just curious, like what your experience has been in terms of common practice there? Yeah, in my experience, unfortunately, it's uh, we look at the live metric at the end and it's dropping. And then we figured out that we need to retrain the model. Uh, I was not as proactive as I could have been. Um, but this is fundamentally, I think this only works for very early stage companies that are really iterating on what their value proposition is versus uh, like Google cannot afford to do this in like their recommender system. Um, so, yeah. Actually, following up on that, Maria, um, what do you think about, you know, um, the process that you described and, you know, um, in terms of figuring out the drop in F1, et cetera, um, is there a possibility to actually make it into a more uh, structured process? Maybe you have a little model, I mean, model, I don't mean like a machine learning model, I mean like a little idea of how your um, model actually behaves over time and maybe you set some thresholds and those thresholds depends on some observations that you do over different out of time splits in the past. And so depending on that, you can come up with a rule or something that says, you know, um, we have seen that in the past, um, when the model dropped uh, more than 10% performance, that was the case that was needed for, um, you know, um, for starting retraining. And maybe we apply that rule later on. Would that make sense as an approach? What do you think? Yeah. I. I think, so that's actually what I ended up doing with these like rolling train and test sets, like figuring out what the performance is on each one. How do you kind of like vary the time in between training? And, uh, but more what that hinted to was like developing some sort of like very deep familiarity and understanding of the ML problem going on. So really one or two people at most has this familiarity with the problem. Um, it becomes very complicated when like what happens when you onboard somebody new to the project? like they don't have this kind of expertise with like exactly like oh when you drop 10 points then you need to retrain um i think that's that's really where the process breaks got it, got it. so you think that you know teaching and um learning about these aspects is the key or do you think that there's another solution for that well ideally what does it mean to teach other people about this right like it's not scalable i i tell you if you're going to maintain my model like oh if it drops 10 points retrain it but that doesn't tell you anything about if you're going to do any other ml project right um so a lot of these things is like a lot of this like sorcery is very project specific um so i don't know what it would be like to be able to standardize this across multiple projects um maybe that's like open question for ml ops got it, got it. O open question that, that's great that's a great to have actually you, we, we know in which direction we should work right uh shreya so one of the things that i think you mentioned a couple times uh during the talk and uh, in some of these questions afterwards was that uh one of the like key ways that you notice dis distribution shift is just you start seeing your metrics drop which um is something that kind of like requires labels uh What's your kind of experience with uh, the, the process of like getting new labels for uh, like this validation process in the online setting? I think we also had a question from the audience um, from Lucy Tan about um, how do you do this debugging in uh, privacy uh, in settings where privacy is a big issue where you might not even be able to go label all the failure cases? Yeah, I cannot speak to the privacy thing because I mean, fortunately or unfortunately I was looking at all the data, um, but like, well, your earlier question was in general, uh, like how do you how do you, how do you like use yeah, get labels? labels in the online setting? How do you yeah what's your with yeah that? okay? Um, I think this really speaks to having a robust um, ETL infrastructure. Actually, um, one thing that was really helpful at my previous company was people standardized on the schema for how clients reported their um, data. I guess. So maybe that means you output, you specifically, there's like a labels table, which you must send, for example, or maybe there's like a sensor table, which you must send and it must conform to this. And uh, I I think this is hard to get a client onboarded in the first place because like then there's, there's, they have to somehow like write a pipeline to just generate the kind of tables or whatever that you need. Um, and maybe that calls for like some forward deployed model or I don't know what that would be. But uh, once that is standardized, 
and you, I, I feel like that kind of infrastructure really helped the ML stuff and take burden away from ML people. Gotcha. Speaking of those practices um, and stuff, I think one of the mentioned things I mentioned early on was the importance of logging um, and how early on you, you didn't quite know what to log um, until like, you know, later you're like, oh, I wish yeah. I logged that. Uh, do you have any thoughts about how we can uh, kind of like get that folk knowledge uh, over to like new people? Um, uh, like, I don't know, either new people for, uh, to your team or just, you know, as we're, you know, training up the next generation of ML engineers, uh, how do we like convey this like hard won folk knowledge? Yeah. Oh man, that's a hard question. Um, one thing that really helped me was uh, stop focusing on the ML when, when, especially when building up like um, applied ML project from scratch, like treat, you, you can even treat the model as like an identity function, build all the pipelining around it and think critically about like, okay, like all of the steps around it, what will each step output um, where will you log these two? Like, oh, you have a like Grafana dashboard. Like, what are you gonna do? Um, and then think about the ML stuff. Um, and then uh, that really helped me. I'm sure it's different for everyone else. Um, but in terms of metrics, like, I think one really big thing is to really make sure that your offline metric is exactly the same as your online metric. And I'd say this, it sounds obvious in practice, it can be very hard, especially with the infrastructure, because like you're training in the offline setting, you're training using a different feature store, maybe um, you're using um, different even tables, like you might even be using different functions to compute that metric versus like in the online setting. Um, so really like writing tests to make sure that they both like literally spit out the same thing is super important. Uh, so we got a question chat, I guess, about um, connecting some of these criteria on accepting and rejecting models, this challenge of when you decide that a model is not good enough and, and kind of doing that connection to a business metrics. I think in your talk, you, you kind of qualified a little bit that uh, the application you considered is not necessarily one where um, you're connecting it to some explicit uh, metrics, but have you seen some established kind of approaches around um, how to uh, translate uh, business criterion into these metrics? I think that's one question and just generally uh, then making decisions on top of those metrics uh, for these types of accept, reject. Uh, yeah, decisions. for sure. I mean, I haven't seen any like how to papers on like how to do this. Um, in my experience, I was very lucky, lucky to work with like biz dev and product managers who um, were well versed in like ML terminology or they very quickly learned it. So they very quickly understood like what does precision mean? What does recall mean? And you, you want to like really map that to exactly like dollars. So for example, if a company has its own internal effort to solve a problem, how, mu how many dollars are they saving? Um, how many, not saving, like how much are they spending? Like separate that in terms of like, um, and, and then figure out like not necessarily what is the M hardest ML problem to solve, but for us it was, what is the easiest ML to problem to solve that saves the most money? Um, because then you can iterate on that, right? And I mean, it just speaks to like everybody needing to be very well versed with like, what is an ML metric and how does that map to a business metric? This is actually very related to another question we got about technical product managers. And so I guess, um, do you, so like somebody asked about like, and I'm not very familiar with what technical product managers are, but uh, but in ML, ML AI teams, do do they have an ML AI background? So I guess just like literacy in terms of just understanding the uh, the ins and outs of doing machine yeah. learning. I, I don't know. I feel like this field is so new. I, I know like large companies are saying like, oh, like if you're a new grad, you need to like do a coding interview before you do PM. And I don't even know what that means, um, but. Yeah, I, I can't answer that question. It's so new, it's so different at every company too. We, we had another uh, interesting question from the audience um, uh, from someone whose first name is Bora and I, I won't try to pronounce their last name. Um, but their question is, uh, how does the nature of kind of the monitoring or the retraining process change with data modality? Like I imagine it's probably very different from you know, tabular data to image data um, to natural language queries. Uh, in, in your experience um, working on any of your problems in, in, uh, in, in practice, yeah. have you noticed those, those changes? Um, yeah, and yeah. kind of how did you deal with them? I, I've not worked with video or image or text data. So I'll give that caveat. Um, 
I mean, in theory, yes, like monitoring will be different for different application, different ML tasks. Um, but I think in practice, something I learned was um, I put in more effort into monitoring the most downstream dependence or most downstream applications and less effort into monitoring like the intermediate model. So let's say you have like an embedding model or something in the middle of the pipeline. And maybe that just speaks to another thing with that is like, it's easier to monitor the most interpretable models and harder to monitor like the deep learning models because like, what do you do? You monitor like, I don't know, like your MSE on your dimensionality reduction model or something or your autoencoder. And like, what do you do with that when that goes low? Whereas if you're monitoring like an XGBoost model and that performance drops, like you can go and you can inspect the top feature and you could actually go make some like decisions based on that. So I think like all these practical considerations um, really impact uh, what effort you put into modeling. And that probably doesn't do, mean anything about in theory what you should be monitoring. Um, just a side note, I guess. So there's a question from the audience, which is actually a general feeling. And I think it's something that you may want to speak about, which is um, what do you think about um, software engineering practices and um, which should be more adopted in, in, in machine learning? Um, what can we learn in general from software engineering in, uh, and systems that we should bring into um, machine learning? Yeah, that's a very broad question. And I'll give one example of something that very much helped me was um, the idea around testing. And I'm sure people have talked about unit testing, integration testing, and like coverage and all of these things. Um, but this is very hard to map to in ML, particularly when ML, like uh, when your code runs, you might not have a correct answer. Like you might train a model and you have no compiler or run timer and you get 3% accuracy. Um, which is very different, right, from software is like you build something and like if it runs, like at least something, like it's not like some like ridiculous uh, bug is going on. Um, so, but one thing also about ML pipelining is like because your code runs doesn't mean anything is accurate and your ML uh, pipeline is not just a function of the code, it's also a function of the data that comes in. Um, and so even just having a unit test, like, what does that mean? Does that mean I test that my like logistic regression fit function works? No, like you want to test that your model has like decent accuracy um, or you don't have any like random drops in your data or like your ETL works as intended. So maybe that means writing assertions everywhere in your pipeline, like asserting that after your ETL, you have unique primary keys or um, asserting that your, well, I don't know, you have at least a few, you have like an expected amount of like positive labels um, before you run any training or so forth. Like so many times I ran into problems and it was like, because I did a join incorrectly or something like that. And maybe people like hate the idea of these like runtime like assertion checks, but I found that it, it just works really well as opposed to nothing. Yeah. Um, kind of speaking along similar lines there, we had a great question in the audience from Ben Lerner um, about kind of the differences between standard software engineering and, and ML engineering. Um, and the thing that he was pointing out was that uh, you can't parallelize modules in the same way, like in ML, in an ML pipeline, when something breaks up front, like it, the errors will just cascade all the way down. Uh, how do you kind of manage uh, those different parts of the pipeline? Um, even when, you know, you might even have like different data scientists working on, on different parts. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is where the assertions are so key. Like they have saved me so many times. Um, and it's being very liberal with assertions, I think it has also been, but I also feel like intrinsically that maybe I shouldn't preach this because why does anyone want like scripts to be running with like 12 assert statements in every single one? I don't know a better solution to be completely honest. Um, the other thing that's really nice about such assertions, especially if you like write them in a standard library or something is uh, when that uh, job fails and it, like it alerts the person, um, it's very obvious why it failed. And even if somebody is like running that pipeline and they didn't write the pipeline, then they can like know that, oh, it's um, because in this batch of data, we actually had no positive labels come in. So we had like a divide by zero error or like some like 
something came in, right? It's all these like random things that cause problems. Um, so yeah. Yeah, gotcha. I, I think assertions are, are a great idea. Um, <laughs> I, I think Matei actually had a, had, a, had a paper all about assertions in, in yeah. <laughs> um, So, uh, you, you know, uh, there, there, there are reasons why certain ideas stick around from the, uh, the 20th century. Um, we, we also had a, a question from uh, Vamsi Sisla in, in the audience about the cost of setting up uh, all the tools to monitor everything throughout the ML pipeline. Um, and it taking, you know, a surprising amount of operational resources. Uh, do you have any thoughts on kind of the cost of setting all of that up? Um, and you may be frozen, actually. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think, I do believe that Treya is frozen. Uh, so um, in the meantime, uh, Matei, what are your thoughts about uh, Treya's talk? Oh, I thought it was a great talk. Yeah, I hope we got her back on the call soon. Yeah, U unique, uh, unique challenges of, of Zoom presentations. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Oh, and she has dropped off the call. Okay. No, she, just, hopefully, uh, yeah, hopefully she will join back soon. I wanted to add the yeah. point on, on the on the asserts. You know, um, if you think about it, to a certain extent, um, that's also partially what types are for, right? If you enforce a type on, on, on yeah. your inputs and your outputs, that also, it, it's, it's a form of, of asserting something about it and preventing potential problems that you may have later on. And so maybe, uh, you know, a str strong, more strongly typed languages, or at least, you know, um, having um, um, type um, annotations in Python could be something that would be useful for us as, as, as a community, I guess. Yeah. yeah, I think, I mean, definitely that. And also I think there's a certain degree of like uh, semantic assertions that- oh, you get me on my phone now. Oh, awesome. Does it work? Oh, sure. hey, Shreya, welcome back. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think, but before you dropped off, uh, I, I was kind of asking about the cost of setting up uh, uh, debugging pipelines through throughout your ML deployment. Um, uh, what would you say to like, you know, an audience member who has to like justify uh, this, this operational cost and these operational resources to their boss or a potentially, you yeah. know, a, a non-technical, uh, in a non-technical position? Yeah. Oh, man. Um, gosh, I don't know. I was very lucky to work with people who, who technically understood that you do need to have monitoring. I think another thing is like in software, um, there is a big culture around monitoring um, that maybe a lot of people don't talk about. I don't know. Um, and there's so many tools around this. And even with data, there's also a lot of monitoring. Like Datadog, for example, is like super utilized. Um, so kind of like maybe pointing to existing history of, you know, every company does this. We cannot just like wake up and try to do it without any ability to check ourselves. I don't know. What, what are some of the, uh, like, I think there was a question about best practices. So what are some of the high value uh, things that you think really help across the pipeline, um, both on the monitoring side, as well as um, just doing ETL and, and so on? Yeah, um, I mentioned this before, right? Like one big challenge I've seen is like knowing what to monitor and what to log. Like you could log everything, but that just means nobody is going to monitor anything because nobody wants to read all those logs. Um, so really like one big thing is like figuring out what is the minimum things that you need to log. Another thing is how do you present this in a very user-friendly format, not just to the data scientists. I'm just speaking as somebody who would potentially like build a tool for a data scientist, but not just for the data scientists, but also to like um, other stakeholders like PMs or business people or something, especially like when you are all working in this, like a lot of people in the industry like work in this agile framework, right? Of like everyone is closely collaborating with each other. They have predefined sprints and like they measure success out of like some whatever they come up with um so maybe that means like creating dashboards with these metrics like sending slack channel alerts of like hey this was the performance of this model um stuff like that i think what was something that was super helpful at my previous company is like using um, metabase or some like dashboarding tool to really uh send people alerts or like allow anybody at the company regardless of whether they have a technical background or not to be able to create a dashboard based off of a model um, off of a question that they're trying to ask right so just 
making it easy for people to know what's going on. Awesome. Yeah, I guess uh, maybe shifting to a maybe more fun question, like, um, I know you were taking a break. So uh, are, is there anything in particular that you're looking at right now? And, and can you tell us a little bit about what what kind of reading and, and interesting things yeah. that you're observing? Um, yeah, I'm taking a break. So in theory, I should not be doing any work. I'm printing for a uh, triathlon. So that takes up a lot of time. Um, but no, I think a lot of the things that I've decided to look into now are really like what is the existing tooling out there? And not just like doing a survey of all the tools in ML Ops, but really like I have my own personal data science project going on and like using every tool for a week and like find, I have yet to come across like a tool that I never used before that like I absolutely love um, of, like deploying like three different types of feature stores and seeing like which one is actually good sort of thing. So that's like really what I'm doing, um, nothing crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I think uh, there was another comment in, 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 in chat, which is interesting about uh, an ML focus language and just maybe the programming side of machine learning. Do you think there's maybe a future where Python isn't just the, the only thing that we use and, and some other languages uh, are developed that kind of handle more gracefully some of the issues around machine learning? And what are Yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. The software has never been a winner takes all industry. Um, I, I, it's ridiculous to me to believe that only Python or like, only one framework will win in the long run. But I, I also think it's important to have empathy for why these like frameworks, like why why Python is the language, right, for machine learning. Like it is a very highly iterative nature or discipline, right? Like data scientists have ideas of models that they want to try. And if you're gonna design an effective framework for them, you need something to allow them to quickly iterate on the ideas. And maybe that means like taking away typing, maybe that means like allowing for a lot of flexibility maybe that means more scripting um, which is very traditional like different from traditional software which is like i go and i like sit outside and i like design the architecture in my head or whatever i write a design job i get the approval of everybody else and then i go code it up in like whatever c or like go right it's very very different and it makes a lot of sense that python is the language and um, a new dsl would like have to have very similar properties could it be, Shreya, that it actually is a, a point that you touched upon in the presentation is the probabilistic nature of the, the, the machine learning projects that we work on. Yeah. Um, you know, that impacts um, the process of developing a machine learning. Um, it's like, it's a loop rather than like a cascade of a process, right? Maybe that's because of that. And also maybe that's the reason why we need more, um, uh, languages that are um, fast to iterate with because we're going to fail a lot because of the probabilistic nature and so maybe that's sure. the reason why we need to um, have you know uh, be fast at failing to a certain extent right yeah i don't know i i feel like i there's so much history for these disciplines that i maybe i wasn't there i wasn't alive through the like 80s and 90s and i, I kind of wish that i was <laughs> to be able to have like a good opinion or like a well-formed opinion on, I don't know what would be next. Well, yeah, I guess on on, on that note, uh, most of us weren't, weren't alive, alive during the 80s. <laughs> uh, at least I wasn't, but uh, but yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks so much, Ria. I, I know we we're almost at time. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we definitely got a ton of questions. We went uh, and covered a lot of ground and uh, really enjoyed your talk. and. Uh, yeah, I want to definitely thank the audience for being very participative and uh, go check out our website, mlsys.stanford.edu and subscribe to our mailing list. Um, we'll have more great talks coming up. Uh, next week, we actually have Piero giving a talk about um, some of the stuff that he's been doing. So we're very excited. Um, and subscribe to our channel as well. I, uh, Dan reminds me that you should hit the bell icon to turn on notifications. I think that's our, uh, our new guidance there. So. Uh, yeah, thanks everyone and uh, see you next time. Bye-bye.